Hello and welcome to the History of Vikings. Today I'm joined by Dr. Elizabeth Ashman Rowe, a reader in Scandinavian history at the University of Cambridge, where she has been teaching Viking and medieval Scandinavian history since 2008. A graduate of Cornell University, she is the author of numerous articles about Scandinavian history and literature. Her first book was about the Icelandic illuminated manuscript known as Flatjörbrók, and her second book was about Ragnar Lodbrok. She is also one of the co-authors of a brand new book about Norse Gaelic contacts in the Irish Sea area. Dr. Elizabeth Ashman Rowe, thank you so much for joining me today. It's my pleasure. It's always good to uh, talk to people who are interested in the Vikings. Thank you. I'm so excited to have you on the podcast. I've been wanting to speak with you for some time, and I'm exceptionally excited about our topic of conversation today, which is the legendary hero of the Old Norse world, uh, Ragnar Lothbrok, someone who whose name is familiar with um, both students of Viking studies and I think more amateur fans of just this era in history, I think probably due to the History Channel's hit TV show. But Ragnar Lothbrok, he is a legendary character in the Old Norse world. But I'm curious, um, if we're to look at things historically, where do we get this idea of Ragnar from? Well, as you mentioned, um, he's well known now from the television show. And it might be good to begin by clarifying where the show gets its information from before delving into uh, the historical sources. But I can begin by saying that he was a historical figure, and there is evidence for that. But the show itself uh, comes from uh, two main sources. One is the story of Ragnar as told by the early 13th century Danish historian Saxo Grammaticus. And Saxo is the one who gives us the figure of um, Lagertha, uh, who has been so amazingly popular um, among all viewers and also who ties in with the current archaeological interest in whether there were women. Uh, warriors in the Viking Age. The other main source for the television show is the saga of Ragnar Lothbrok, and this is an Icelandic uh, composition from the second half of the 13th century. So we should begin by remembering that where the show comes from um, is mostly um, late medieval ideas about who Ragnar was. So Ragnar's saga gives us the character of Auslag, um, Ragnar's sons, such as Ivar, Bjorn, and Sigurd, Snake in the Eye, and also characters such as the English king Ayala, um, who should properly just be called Ella. But then the producers of the show have added a variety of um, motifs and, and figures and topics from uh, unrelated sources about the Viking Age. So we get scenes that come from the Anglo Saxon Chronicle, from the history of uh, Widdikind of Corvée, who tells us about Papa's ordeal um, carrying the hot iron. There's a late 9th century Latin um, poem about Viking attacks on Paris, uh, and also a variety of Icelandic sagas, the historical character of Rollo, who becomes the first count of Normandy, Arabic sources, and so on and so forth. So what the show gives us is medieval literature with quite a lot of other um, Viking material woven into it. Interesting. Interesting. So um, now the saga of Ragnar Lothbrok, could you tell our listeners a little bit about that piece of literature? We've discussed various uh, Old Norse sagas on the podcast before and uh, with various scholars and sort of whether or not they can be used as historical sources for the Viking Age. But what should we keep in mind about Ragnar's saga? We should keep in mind that this is very much a legendary saga, um, and in particular, it seems to have been composed to be a sequel to the saga about the Volsungs. So in some sense, it's not wholly independent, but rather it takes as its starting point the end of Volsunga saga. So Sigurd the Dragon Slayer and um, Brynhild the Valkyrie, they've They've uh, had a child, um, Auslag, and Ragnar Saga actually picks up where Volsunga Saga starts off, and it talks about um, Auslag being 
uh, smuggled away to safety uh, inside a, a harp, and then she's raised by by peasants, um, and uh, that's where Ragnar finds her. So um, the Icelandic saga, um, on one hand, is interested in continuing the legend um, of, uh, of of Ragnar in conjunction with the legend of Sigurd the dragon slayer, but also many Icelanders considered that they were descendants of Ragnar through one of his sons, and also Ragnar became added to the genealogies of the kings of Norway. So the Icelanders actually had multiple reasons for being interested in uh, in Ragnar, and this saga is one of many Icelandic compositions that mention him. And so we have to keep all those contemporary reasons for the interest in Ragnar in mind when we read that particular saga. It's not very historical. Interesting. So that um, is there any evidence for his existence as a figure in history? I mean, you mentioned that he was added to the genealogies of the, the kings of, of Norway. But um, is what is the evidence, if any, for his existence as a figure in history? Right. So we do have what we can consider to be very reliable evidence for Ragnar as a historical figure. And this evidence comes from the Frankish annals that talk about the Viking attack on Paris in 845. So this attack is mentioned in several different annals, the annals of Fulda, the annals of Saint-Bertin, and the annals of saint And it's that last set of annals that names the leader of the Vikings uh, as Regan Harry. So that's the archaic form of the name that later became Ragnar. And then also we have a source that was written um, shortly afterwards, which talks about what happened to Ragnar after he, not just what he did in Paris, but also what happened to him when he got back to Norway. And so this source um, has the title, um, it, it's in Latin, uh, Translatio Sancti Germanus. And so that translates to um, the translation of the relics of uh, Saint Germanus. And so this is the saint who gave his name to Saint Germain de Pre, um, which was a monastery at the time uh, outside of Paris and is now uh, inside Paris on, on the left bank. And so this was the monastery that Ragnar's Vikings um, attacked and sacked and then used as their base to try to get across the River Seine into Paris proper at the time. And so on one hand, this account celebrates St. Germanus um, by saying that he's the one who caused the Vikings to leave. And what, and reading between the lines, uh, it appears that what happened is that uh, once the Vikings were in siege mode, their hygiene was not very good, and they came down with dysentery and other diseases. And so, actually, they were so sick and so unable to continue that they actually sued for peace, and King Charles of the French allowed them to return to Scandinavia. Um, and then it just so happens that we have an account of what happened in Denmark. And this came from an envoy from the German king, um, who was in Denmark at the court of King Horik for completely different diplomatic reasons. But he was there when Ragnar and his men returned from, from Paris. And this uh, envoy, Count Cabo, saw what happened. And when he returned to Europe, he passed through Paris and he went to the monastery of Saint-Germain to tell the monks what had happened to the horrible pagans who had desecrated their their monastery. And so it's Cabo's account that tells us that um, Ragnar goes before King Horik and boasts about, on one hand, uh, the wealth of France, but also the cowardice of the Frenchmen. Um, but then Ragnar's boasting is interrupted by what seems to be a, a physical attack on him by the spirit of St. Germanus. Um, and in fact, Ragnar is coming down with dysentery himself, and he has terrible, he's in terrible agony for three days. And then according to this account, his entrails burst um, and, and he dies. So the story on one hand is a hagiographical account celebrating the power of this particular saint and also 
depicting the event in such a way as to show that God punishes um, pagans. But also, because we have other accounts of um, the Vikings, this particular raid that talks about them becoming ill at the end, and also we know that this was characteristic of other Viking Viking sieges, that they became, they became ill, um, it seems that there is an underlying historical, uh, historical account there. So in contrast to what the show um, uh, conveys that Ragnar survives uh, his illness at Paris and goes on for many other adventures, in fact, the historical evidence um, is that his, his life ended uh, in Denmark in that year. Also, there's one more piece of evidence that contributes to our understanding of him as a historical figure, and that's his nickname, Lothbrok, which means hairy pants or shaggy breeches or something like that. And so this nickname is consistent with historical events. Um, if you consider that the description, well, how he got this nickname, according to the saga, is that he was going to fight um, a serpent that spits poisonous venom. And so he was going to protect himself by wearing um, uh, clothing that had been boiled in pitch. And in the saga, this does protect him. But if you think about the possibility, somebody suffering from dysentery and having their entrails um, uh, burst and so forth, you could imagine somebody present at the scene describing it, saying it's as though his breeches were covered in in black tar, that they were black and sticky, that they were they were covered it's as though they had been boiled in pitch. And so the nickname Lothbrok then um, is first found in the work of a Norman historian. This is William of Shumiash, who's writing around 1050. And William is not Scandinavian himself. He didn't speak Old Norse. There is no way that he could have invented a nickname that makes sense in Old Norse and also is consistent with what happened to the historical Ragnar. So I would count that nickname. Um, uh, appearing early as uh, a kind of historical evidence. I have to ask, so obviously the great heathen army, as listeners are familiar, has a, a great deal to do with the sons of Ragnar Lothbrok, um, and that has to do with the uh, conquest of England. Is there any um, sort of evidence in the history of Viking Age England that uh, is notable when talking about Ragnar that sort of gives us a glimpse of Ragnar's existence as a figure in history? No, no. In fact, there isn't. Um, there's definite historical evidence suggesting that the leaders of the great army were um, brothers um, named uh, Ivar and Haftan and Uba or Huba. Um, there's no mention of a, a Bjorn um, in, in England. And so we have evidence about these about these figures from the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle and related documents. And also we hear about Ivar and Haftan, or at least met Vikings of the same name, in the Irish annals as well. And there's some debate as to whether the Ivar in Dublin is the same person as the the Ivar, the Invara of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles, but um it's possible that they're the same, the same, the same figure, but none of the contemporary sources in England or Ireland mention the the name of the father of these leaders of the great army, and it's only um, later sources that associate Ivar um, with with Ragnar. Interesting. Okay. Yes, that makes perfect sense. Well, how can studying the life and deeds of Ragnar Lothbrok benefit a student of Viking studies? I think you, um, more so than anyone, would be able to answer this question. Um, but yeah, I'm curious, how do you think that studying Ragnar can benefit someone interested in the Viking Age? There are many ways in, in which Ragnar uh, and, and his, his fate um, and the sources about him are important for historical st or students of, of the Viking Age um, as a historical discipline. So for one thing, we have a detailed account of the Viking siege of Paris in 845. Um, and so 
thanks to Cabo's report and the the monks of Saint uh, Germain who wrote it all up, we know much more about what happened there than we do for other Viking attacks, where the descriptions are uh, much shorter and much more much more general. So we hear, for example, that the Vikings in Paris killed more than a hundred um, Christians and and uh, strung up their bodies, and this was a way of, among other things, terrorizing terrorizing the French. And so that's a detail that we don't hear about from any other sources. So uh, it's an open question: Was it a kind of pagan sacrifice? Was it merely a terrorist attack, or or whatever? Um, the information about their coming down with dysentery is uh, is quite significant is quite significant as as well. So, just in terms of the information about what particular Vikings are doing at a particular time and place, uh, Ragnar's story gives us more information about that. An additional significance of the accounts of the Viking attack on Paris in 845 is that it relates to Viking history more broadly. So one thing to consider is, was this attack part of the foreign policy of King Horik of Denmark? And he is somebody who throughout his, uh, throughout his reign, um, mostly he begins as being the, the sole ruler of Denmark. He's a powerful king of, of a small but wealthy and strategically located country. and. Viking, uh, Danish Vikings are attacking the, the Frankish Empire, and so the Franks are trying to put an end to that, and they, they try various things. They try to persuade Horik to become, to become a Christian, and the Franks hire other Danish Vikings to uh, protect uh, Frisia and other, other places from, from uh, Danish, Danish attacks. And so the extent to which Horik is aggressive against the Franks or to the, the extent to which he makes overtures uh, to them, for example, accepting the presence of the missionary Ansgar. Um, this is something that connects with uh, the story of Ragnar because the very same year that Ragnar leads the attack on Paris, um, a very large Viking, Viking fleet from Denmark um, attacks um, uh, attacks Hamburg, um, which is the the seat of uh, the missionary effort against or towards Scandinavia, and so they uh, they sack the they sack the town, and the missionary effort is uh, is is nearly put to an end there. And so historians can ask: um, the attack on on Hamburg uh, was associated by the Franks who were writing about it. They were saying that this was sent by by King Horik. Um, he directly commanded this, and so. Historians can also ask, was Horik trying to implement a, a kind of a two-pronged attack? And so he also sent Ragnar to Paris. So there are two attacks on the Franks at the same time. So that's a question. But another interpretation is that Ragnar is actually setting himself up as a rival to Horik um, because any male in the royal family, in royal families in Scandinavia, um, any male had an equal claim to the throne. And so it could be that Ragnar, um, uh, who possibly was King Horik's cousin, that's been suggested. Uh, there's a long, complicated uh, circumstantial uh, argument behind that, but it's been suggested that he himself was in the, the royal family, um, and if so, it's possible that the attack on Paris was meant to gain the wealth and the reputation that would allow him to come back and um, and confront Horik. And if Ragnar hadn't gotten sick and died, it's possible that Ragnar could have made himself king. So both the domestic policy of Viking Age Denmark and the foreign policy of Viking Age Denmark um, uh, are both important for thinking about Ragnar in terms of Viking Viking studies in general. Other ways in which studying Ragnar can benefit a student of Viking studies is that it's interesting to see how legends about Ragnar, who's you know, from the mid-9th ninth century, so he's part of the first Viking age, um, that these legends become relevant to the second Viking age. Um, and so here we're talking um, 
about the, the end of the 10th century and then the early 11th century where King Sven Fortbeard of Denmark um, and his associates are raiding in England and Sven makes himself king of England. And then um, although he dies abruptly, uh, his son Knut is able to make himself king of England um, as well. And so it's quite significant that when an Icelandic poet composes um, uh, verses in honor of King Knut, um, he begins by referring to Ivar the Boneless um, and uh, and the the the, um, the death of the death by by blood eagle. At least that's sort of what the verses sound like. They may be misinterpreted, but in any case, um, it's Ivar who causes the death of. Uh, King Ella of of York, and so an Icelandic poet um, is actively looking back to the legend of Ragnar and Ragnar's sons um, to celebrate a contemporary Viking uh, conquering Danish king um, of of his own time. Um, another way in which the Ragnar legends pertain uh, to the Second Viking Age is that Bjorn's nickname is Ironside. Um, Yarnsida. And so no other man in Scandinavia has that nickname from all the sources that um, that have survived today. And it seems most likely that Bjorn is given his nickname in imitation of the English prince, um, Edmund Ironside, um, who gains that nickname through his um, uh, fights against the Danes, the invading Danes, uh, at the beginning of the 11th century. And so it's interesting to see how an Anglo-Saxon hero, uh, the nickname from, from that figure gets attached to a Viking, a Viking figure, um, and then that's incorporated into the um, medieval saga in, in Iceland. So we see England and, and Scandinavia interacting in, in different ways. Yet another way in which studying Ragnar can benefit um, a student of the historical Viking Age is that the stories about Ragnar absolutely demonstrate how important rigorous source criticism is when looking at the evidence for the Viking Age. Stories about Ragnar or about somebody named Lothbrok, they're found in, in Germany, in France, in England, in Denmark, and in Iceland. So we need to think about what are the historically plausible channels of communication, um, and we need to be critical and think what looks like independent developments. Um, in instead, we really need to examine our assumptions about how these, where these stories come from, and how they get circulated. Also, another issue of source criticism is that stories about Ragnar or somebody named Lothbrok, they're found in Christian Latin sources as well as in Old Norse prose and poetry. And this leads to um, two important uh, points. One is that arguably this Christian uh, Latin literature can preserve information about the Viking Age. The other thing that we that this kind of interaction between the Latin sources and the vernacular sources indicates is that we see that Christian and Latin sources definitely influence Old Norse vernacular traditions. And in particular, we see that in the nickname of Ivar as the boneless. Um, literally, there can't have been a Viking leader who had no bones. Um, and instead, the nickname must come from a misunderstanding of the Latin adjective exosis, which means detestable or horrible or, or, or um uh, some some very negative uh, word like that. So exosis um, has been mistaken for exos, which means without without bones. So the only way that Ivar could be known in Old Norse as benloisi, um, the boneless, um, it must come from from a Latin a Latin source. And then the last point, maybe not the very last point, but uh, a third point to make about uh, issues in source criticism is that understanding the literary nature of these sources is absolutely essential because only through literary uh, criticism can we see that can we see the relationship between Saxo's account of Ragnar and Ragnar saga account of Ragnar and also the relationship between the saga of Ragnar uh, 
and the saga about St. Olaf, the king of Norway, we find in Heimskringla, written by Snorri Sturluson um, in, in the 13th century. Fascinating, fascinating. Now, that was very helpful. Um, well, now, Dr. Rowe, we talked mm-hmm. about a variety of sources that deal with Ragnar Lothbrok um, over the course of our conversation today. And the last question I'll ask you today is, for all of our listeners who would like to continue learning more about Ragnar Lothbrok, can you recommend uh, some reading for them and maybe some some of the uh, sources that you assign to students of your own? Right. Well, uh, to be perfectly candid, uh, the best source for Ragnar and uh, the various um, texts that mention him is my own book. Um, it's called Vikings in the West, The Legend of Ragnar Lothbrok and His Sons. Um, you can get it over the internet by ordering it from the publishers. And perhaps, Noah, you, I, I can give you the URL from that. Um, uh, so that is, that, that's got everything I know about Ragnar in it. Um, and all the texts are translated into English. So it's accessible to, to everybody. But otherwise, to get a more general understanding um, of the Vikings, uh, I would suggest the Oxford Illustrated History of the Vikings, um, which is edited by Peter Sawyer. And it has chapters on, on the Vikings uh, in France and in England and so forth. And it provides a very good overview of the Viking Age. Wonderful. And yes, absolutely. I will put a link to your book in the description of this episode and encourage everyone listening to pick up a copy so you can continue learning about Ragnar Lothbrok. Well, Dr. Elizabeth Ashman Rowe, it's been such a pleasure talking with you today. I've certainly learned such a great deal, but thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you very much for inviting me.